According to the cloud now, the cloud. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters for today. Um, this is Jenny Dale, the Information Literacy Coordinator at UNCG Libraries. Um, I proposed the uh, ULBLC, as you'll hear me call it, um, because I wanted us to all have a way to build some community and also do some sort of shared learning and just kind of generally sharing professional development kind of stuff um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are obviously in um, a, an unprecedented situation in many of our lifetimes. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we could continue learning and sharing even while we're working at this more sort of social distance, especially now with the stay at home order and people not being able to do their usual work in the libraries. Um, so I will have the archived version of this uh, up on the ULBLC LibGuide, which I will put the link in right now. Uh, and if you haven't been there yet, I bet many of you have, I see some familiar faces. Um, this is where you can see our calendar of upcoming events. So we've got something scheduled every day for the rest of this week, and I've got a couple things uh, on uh, that are being discussed for next week. And that's also where you could find archived versions of past webinars um, when they are available. So hopefully Melody and Rachel are okay with this being uh, archived since it's being recorded and we can make it available that way. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some logistics. Again, I think many of you, I think we're all becoming Zoom experts. We're all becoming Zoom variants is the term I'm using. Um, so just in case you're new to this format, um, you should have come in muted on entry. It looks like everyone is muted. Um, there will be um, points at which you can potentially turn your audio on, but I'm going to recommend that if people have questions, they use the chat. I'll monitor the chat while um, Rachel and then Melody are talking, and then I will um, share the questions that you've chatted in with them when we have sort of a natural point um, for doing that kind of sharing. Um, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to use the chat. I will try to guide you through some options, um, but in the worst case scenario, I would be, um, I'll remind you that we will have uh, this available as an archived session on that ULBLC guide, as long as, again, Rachel and Melody are cool with that. So before I introduce Rachel and Melody more formally, um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, awesome. Um, again, if you do, please feel free to use the chat. So today's session is being hosted by Rachel Olson, UNCG's first year communication and social sciences librarian, and Melody Rood, our student success librarian. They're going to be talking about a research project they're undertaking about Hispanic and Latinx, Latina, I don't know how to, how to say the Latin owl, and we will talk about why. Ooh, excellent. Uh, students at UNCG. So I'm going to turn it over to them. But again, Rachel and Melody, I will be uh, monitoring chat and letting you know when there are when there's a Q&A time, what questions you've been getting. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, let me know if anyone's having trouble hearing me. I'm always nervous when there's not like a mic that I can see in front of my face. So anyway, um, I am Rachel Olson, and I'm first year communication and social sciences librarian, as Jenny said, and then in a little bit, you're going to hear from Melody, our student success librarian. So um, thank you for coming today. Um, and before we get started, um, we talked about this and just want to make it really clear. So uh, Melody and I, we are not uh, we don't identify as Hispanic or Latin now, either of us. So we just want to recognize that our perspectives and experiences are going to differ from those of the patrons that we're studying. Um, and this research is very much intended to attempt to understand the information needs of the student group and not to speak for or on behalf of these students. So we just want to make that clear um, from the outset. <clears throat> so a little bit of background. <coughs> Excuse me, a little cough. Um, 
just a review of some like literature out there and statistics um, that you might find interesting. So what is the difference between Hispanic and Latin now? They are terms that often get used interchangeably, but they are different. So a Hispanic person is someone who traces their heritage to a country whose primary spoken language is Spanish. So <clears throat> think about Spain, Venezuela, Mexico, Honduras, lots of other countries. That's Hispanic. A person who identifies as Latin Al is someone who traces their heritage to a country that is located in Latin America. So um, you could technically be considered Hispanic without being Latin Al or Latin Al without being Hispanic. Um, and, you know, if anyone has questions about that, we could talk. But it's a um, something that is used commonly, interchangeably, but not many people know the difference. So there you go. And um, I'll share these slides later with you for sure. You'll have access. So why are we saying Latin Al? Okay, good question. So um, some people say Latino, some people say Latina, some people say Latin X, um, but we've chosen to use Latin Al. Um, it has to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, gender, some, sometimes it has to do with gender identity issues. Um, there are other reasons as well. We talked with the director and assistant director of the Office of Intercultural Engagement at UNCG. Um, and both of those folks identify as Latin Al, so they were really good uh, partners um, for us to try to figure out how best to um, label things. So. So one thing that we really want to make clear as we go through this is that even though we have these definitions of Hispanic and Latin now, um, identity is a very personal thing. Um, and it's not for us to put a person in a box and say, oh, you're speaking Spanish, you must be Hispanic, something like that, or to, you know, try and try and label people. Um, we want to respect people's identities. Um, and so you'll hear me use this terminology, um, but there are exceptions to every rule and people very much have to define their own personal um, sort of identity. So. Um, so here's a couple statistics from Pew Research Center that I just sort of find interesting. And these statistics both are from 2014, so are a little bit outdated, um, but I think that the trends are still reflecting this. So um, as of 2014, approximately 35% of people who identified as Hispanic that were 18 to 24 year old were enrolled in college. So 35% as opposed to, you can see whites, blacks, Asians, um, different rates. Um, and you can see growth um, with most groups for about the past a little about a little less than 20 years. Um, so there has been positive growth over time. Um, and we're also, uh, you can compare it to college completion. Um, so this one's interesting and perhaps a little bit misleading. So this talks about, again, in 2014, people who were just out of this age range over here on the left who had a bachelor's degree, it's 15%. Um, so it's a little bit misleading because you might think, okay, well, a lot of Hispanic people are enrolling in college, but not a lot are finishing. And it's true that there are some college completion issues that we tend to see with this group. But one, uh, one thing to remember is that many Hispanic and Latin now students are not going to four year colleges. So they wouldn't be getting bachelor's degrees. <clears throat> Most Hispanic and Latin now students are actually choosing to attend two year or community college. So that's why even though it looks like enrollment is growing, growing, growing over here, you're still not seeing a lot of people with bachelor's degrees. So um, it is, again, it is true that there are completion issues and, and we'll get into some of that and why that is, um, but I don't want you to be misled by that. Um, it tends to equal lower student debt. There are many reasons why a person might choose a two year community college. I know we have, um, I have no idea, Mark, we'll have to talk about that later. Um, so, uh, it's going to equal lower student debt. We have a really good um, community college system in the state of North Carolina, I know. Um, so uh, that could be one potential reason. And also Latin now women are more likely to enroll in college. So that's an interesting sort of statistic. They're sort of the new majority among this group. But dropout rates are remaining pretty high. Um, and you have to think about the personal cost of attending college is something that you tend to encounter. Um, uh, when you think about why people uh, go to college, don't necessarily finish college, there are lots of sort of personal things, cultural things um, that might be involved uh, in that. And some of that's reflected in the literature, and we could definitely talk about that. Yeah, so Mark is asking this question, um, which, 
Okay. Um, why are the numbers way over 100? And Maggie's correct. A lot of peer research questions don't have mutually exclusive responses. Um, and it also, I mean, there could be a number of different factors on this. Uh, I'm going to choose not to focus on that. So let's keep going. So in 2016, when I was a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill, um, I did this study. I got sort of interested in um, all still students are required to complete a master's paper. Um, and so for my topic, I chose to study uh, Hispanic and Latin now students in academic libraries and sort of their perceptions and needs and um, <coughs> effects. So when you start digging into Hispanic students in higher education, you have what we call Hispanic serving institutions. And these are colleges or universities who have 25% or more Hispanic or Latin now enrollment. Um, and there are some special resources and support um, associated with being an HSI, and we could get more into that later. Um, as of 2016, when I was doing this research as a graduate student, there were no HSIs in North Carolina. Um, that has changed now. So Samson Community College, as of the 2017-2018 school year, had an enrollment of 28% Hispanic and Latino students. And we also have six emerging HSIs. So what that means is you have these numbers, um, they're approaching 25 or are projected to reach 25 um, before too terribly long. And you will notice that they are mostly two-year institutions. Um, and also you have John Wesley and Salem College as well. And there are reasons for that. Um, there are lots of things that we could potentially get into it. Some of it has to do with financial aid options that are available to certain groups of people. Um, again, some of it is that you can get a high quality education for a lot less money at a two year college. Multiple, multiple reasons um, for this, but there are six emerging. You will notice that none of the UNC system schools are emerging HSI. Although we do have minority serving institutions, I believe UNCG is classified as a minority serving institution, um, which is a little bit different. So when we look specifically at this sort of library phenomenon, um, it's something that I have called library anxiety. I did not come up with that terminology, by the way. That's something that's been around since the late 80s. Um, so library anxiety is this idea that when we come into a library space, um, not everybody feels comfortable, not everybody feels welcome, not everybody feels as though um, they have the agency to ask for help. Um, and it could be for a lot of different reasons. So I found that when students are interacting with librarians, specifically in an academic library setting, um, <coughs> recognition and familiarity is really important. So if you're someone who works with students as part of your job, um, you'll probably notice that students who have seen you before, students who know you are more likely to come up to you and say, hey, you came to my class that time, you know, can you help me with this? Um, it can also have to do with cultural familiarity. There's just this sort of thing, if my librarian doesn't look like me, um, I'm probably not as likely statistically to walk up to them and ask for help. And that has to do with some cultural norms that are related to asking for assistance. Um, a lot of people, and this is true across many different cultures, um, a lot of people have been taught that if you ask for help, you're somehow stupid or weak or that you're bothering someone. Um, again, anyone who works in public services has probably had someone come up to you and say, I'm really sorry to bother you, but can you help me with this question? Um, so we see this in a lot of different student groups, but <clears throat> I think that um, maybe there's some really key things that happen with library anxiety in general. There's also this sort of mindset that we have, this value that we some people have in libraries where we run them like businesses rather than running them um, for what they are. Libraries are not businesses. So this customer mindset versus a patron mindset, like you're seeing them as less, um, uh, we're sometimes trained to see our, our patrons in a more formal way and like we take out some of the empathy and compassion and I think it's sort of missing um, a lot of sort of the point of working in a library. Um, but anyway, so running a library like a business can create some uncomfortableness for patrons. It can create some anxiety um, if you're treated in this rigid way. So that's something that um, I've sort of started exploring, but these first two bullets are definitely the big ones that you find in the literature. My slide will change. So the best solution, oops, hang on, I'm having input issues. Hang on one second. Oh no, sharing is paused. 
Hang on guys, my computer just, there we go. So the best solution uh, to solving library anxiety issues among specifically Hispanic and Latin now students would be to hire librarians of color. Um, and Chris Borg, who is um, the head librarian at MIT, she wrote this back uh, in 2014, a while ago, and basically breaks down how we are, um, li like the makeup of librarians, we're just overwhelmed, it's an overwhelmingly white and female profession, um, at least that's how it's shaken out. So you can see um, the sort of racial composition of librarians in 2010 versus the racial composition of the U.S. population. And I know that this is hard to see. Um, the graphs really don't zoom in well. So again, you're going to have a link to these slides, which will take you to this page if you're interested in exploring. But basically, the idea is that the makeup of our profession does not at all match the makeup of the populations that we're going to serve. So by far, um, at least in my mind, the most ethical solution, the most, um, the right thing to do for our profession and for the direction that our population is moving in is to hire librarians of color um, and to make an effort um, to make those sort of initiatives uh, a priority and, and stuff like that. So uh, this is an interesting one as well, the projected population <clears throat> of the United States, again, versus racial composition of librarians. They're just, um, very, very few uh, librarians. And here's a breakdown um, of librarians of color in this one particular snapshot that she took. And you can see that uh, Latin now folks were uh, 3,600 versus the target, according to her calculations, which is about 20,000. So there's definitely a problem. Um, and I don't want to try and beat around the bush. The obvious solution, the best solution, the right thing to do is to hire librarians of color. So other questions to consider, um, other questions that I've considered in the past and will continue to explore our LIS programs preparing librarians to work with students. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Are LIS programs actively recruiting future librarians of color, particularly LIS professors, people who are sort of theorizing about the field. Um, <laughs> there's a focus in the literature on PhD students of color in LIS, um, and also training librarians to work with students from a variety of backgrounds professionally and with empathy. I think that this is something that we all <clears throat> could and should be working on I'm um, just thinking about, you know, how best to make people feel comfortable, feel welcome, um, and, you know, best practices for that. So lots of interesting things around this sort of topic. And this quote comes from an article um, which actually talked about Black librarians, um, but I think it has a lot of implications for Hispanic folks as well, um, and for lots of, I mean, lots of different groups within librarianship. Basically, if we're going to make this field something that we want people to come to, if we want people to, um, if we want more librarians of color, we have to give people the opportunity um, to shape the principles and practices that define our field. It's, it's very, um, you know, it seems obvious to me, people should have the opportunity to influence what's, what's being done, how other people are being taught to practice librarianship. So definitely a focus on uh, PhD students of color in LIS was something that um, when I did this UNC study, I found to be really interesting. So I'm going to stop sharing and Melody is going to take over here. All right, give me one second. Okay. All right. Can everybody see my screen and hear me? Yep. Looks okay, good. great. Perfect. Okay, so that brings us up to speed to the UNCG study that Rachel and I are working on. And, you know, I just want to note that uh, Rachel has put a lot of work into this prior to my involvement um, with the UNCC study, or sorry, the UNC Chapel Hill study, um, and just like general um, research interests. So she invited me to be a part of this. Um, not long after I started, so I'm really grateful for that opportunity and I kind of just wanted to take a minute to recognize the work that she has done prior to this, to my involvement, um, and give her kudos for that. So this is something that we started to work on kind of in the fall of 2019, um, and it's something that is ongoing, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So a little bit about the process. Um, 
Obviously, an important part of doing your research is collecting literature. And like I just mentioned, Rachel had already done a lot of work with this prior to my involvement. So she already had a curated collection of literature that directly related to Hispanic and Latin owl identities and experiences in uh, the library, but also higher ed in general. So it was really important for me to make sure that I read through all of those and annotate those so that I could get caught up. Um, and then obviously we uh, created a Zotero shared folder so that we can pretty much drop anything new that we found that related to the research that could help with that as well. Um, and then also, uh, as Rachel mentioned earlier, she consulted with uh, Gus Pena and Daisy Santiago, who, if you don't know, are the director and assistant director of the Office of Intercultural Engagement. And they were the ones who suggested that we use um, Latin Owl. Um, and they also had some other suggestions as well. So in terms of the survey design, sampling, marketing, recruitment, um, all of that sort of goes um, hand in hand with the IRB because everything that we used from this survey design to the marketing to the emails that we sent had to be IRB approved. Um, and we also had to finish our IRB training too. So uh, that was a step that we had to take. But basically the survey was created through Qualtrics and it consisted of 21 questions, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. Um, students were asked, you know, some basic background and questions, you know, about uh, what year they're in, um, their age range, uh, their major, that kind of thing. Um, but then also they were asked to rate their experiences related to the library based on a Likert type scale. And then they also had space for um, qualitative responses as well. Um, and I believe we had roughly 60-ish responses. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I can get back to you all with that. Um, so we created the survey and once that was approved, um, we were able to uh, start with the marketing. And again, like I mentioned, that also had to be IRB approved. So I created a poster using um, the approved marketing colors that we have through the library and it included a go link to the survey. So we sent that to the IRB that got approved. Um, after that, we were able to print and disseminate those throughout the library and campus. So you've probably seen them on our doors. You might have seen the big poster that, um, you know, was sort of living uh, over by the reference desk and the um, current literature, that little lobby area right there. Um, it was up there for a while. Um, and then we also had digital um, um, marketing as well that showed on the screens uh, throughout the library and the DMC and the intro of the library. Um, and then we also had, you know, the digital posters that we then sent out to folks. So some people that we reached out to, we sent um, uh, an email that sort of explained what the study was, who we are, why we're doing it, how, you know, folks can help and uh, sent that to the CHANCE students, so the students who were involved with CHANCE. And that's something that, uh, you know, both Rachel and I are um, familiar with because we work with them. Um, for those of you who don't know, CHANCE is a week-long uh, summer program for uh, Hispanic and Latino high school students. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to come onto campus for a week and live in the dorms and sort of have this immersive college experience. And that is something that um, Rachel has been a part of for a little while. And uh, I just became a part of um, starting last year when I started. So I'm still pretty new to it. Um, but because we uh, are both involved with that, we had access to that list. Um, and then, um, and just to be clear, that's chance students who um, help with that project, not the high school students. Um, so they are UNCG students. Um, and then uh, I also sent um, marketing materials to basically all of the student success offices. And then I also looked up some um, relevant uh, student groups that relate to uh, Hispanic and Latino identities and found their contact emails and sent that as well. So some preliminary findings. Um, so basically, because we are not done with this research, um, we have some next steps that we want to do. Um, we're just going to show kind of a snapshot of, or snapshot of um, 
the some of our findings. This is not something where we're going to show you all of it and we're going to talk and uh, you know come to conclusions about what the meanings are. We're just kind of sharing some of the data with y'all. Um, so the first thing is what year of your degree program are you in? So just take a second to look at this. You can see that the majority of the students who responded are in their second year, followed by third and first. I'm not sure why the fifth or more is right in the middle there, but. That uh, is my fault. Google Sheets is not my friend, so. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Well, uh, yeah, so this is just sort of um, a snapshot of what that looked like with those responses. And again, we're not putting any meaning to any of this right now. We're just kind of showing you the data. How often do you visit the libraries on campus? Uh, there were six uh, selections that they could have chosen from. Um, so take a second to look at those different options. You can see that the majority of the students visit the library four to six times a week. All right, I'm gonna move on. And then these are some quotes that um, I pulled from our data um, based on some questions that we asked, and I sort of just picked these at random. So the first question is, have you ever asked a library staff member for assistance? Why or why not? Um, and the first quote says, I asked for help when looking for a book about McCarthyism. My professor wanted us to use a print source. So sort of a specific example. Um, somebody else said yes. However, sometimes they are not willing to help. And then uh, the last one is, no, I'm familiar with libraries and tend to know where everything is. Um, do you feel comfortable using the library? Why or why not? Um, yes, because it is a large area and there are rooms that can be reserved for silence. Yes, it feels very inclusive and welcoming. And finally, neutral. I go to Jackson to study, but not for anything else. So those are just some of the responses that we got. So obviously um, things have changed. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to consider the future of this research because we did have plans to continue it, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But yeah, um, given that the semester, um, the face-to-face -face semester has ended, um, our plans have changed a bit. So some adjustments that we had to make um, were, uh, the big one is that we had to postpone focus groups. So basically we had planned on doing um, these focus gr groups that we would record and have some follow-up questions that would be um, maybe a little bit more intimate than the Qualtrics survey. And uh, one of the questions in the survey that we sent out was, you know, would you be willing to be a part of this recorded focus group? Um, we planned on compensating these students with gift cards um, and um, ordering pizzas for them. We had like just gotten the okay uh, to order pizza and drinks as sort of an incentive, but also to like let them know that we appreciate them taking the time. Um, we were picking out dates. Uh, we had just gotten done actually picking out dates um, that students could choose from um, for them to take part in this focus group. And then like, I mean, honestly, it was like a couple days later, we pretty much found out that uh, we would be working from home and then, you know, things progressed since then. So uh, that is something that we um, will have to postpone now. Um, it also means reduced opportunities for presentations. Obviously, we're presenting on it right now, but we're sort of talking about the process. Um, but since we are not done with the uh, research, um, you know, even if we wanted to present something in late summer or early fall, um, until we finish those focus groups, we don't have complete research yet. And then there's also the issue with recruitment. So if we decide to redo this in fall of 2020 in terms of like focus groups or like pick back up, there's um, the chance that uh, we will have reduced participation. Um, it's just, you know, a lot of time will have passed since those students took those surveys. Some of those students might be graduated, their schedules might be different. Um, it's very different from, you know, taking the survey in December of 2019 and then doing a focus group uh, early April um, versus, you know, taking it in 2019 of December and then, you know, doing a focus group in August of 2020. So. Um, we, we do recognize that that might be a possibility that we will 
um, have reduced participation. Nevertheless, we plan to still uh, conduct the focus groups um, and record those, transcribe and code the recordings, and then obviously um, we will have to piece all of it together um, with a formal literature review and discussion and conclusions, which you know, obviously, like I mentioned before, we are not talking about today because the research is not complete, um, but that is um, a future goal. And then um, look into publication venues and presentation opportunities as well. So I believe that is it for our future goals. And I guess we can open it up for questions now. So I haven't seen any questions in the chat except for um, Mark's question about the numbers not adding up, which Rachel addressed and Maggie also addressed in the chat. Um, so if people have questions that they want to put in the chat or, um, you know, if you uh, have, you know, if you have other questions about the study or their future plans, please feel free to put those in the chat right now. Um, while we're waiting for people to do that, I will say we're going to share the slides, which will include references to some of the articles and sort of studies that we've consulted. Um, I'm having Zotero issues as well as Google Sheets issues. So as soon as I get those resolved, we'll send that on to you all. Um, yeah, so Patrick, Patrick's question is, are you planning to use this study in planning for library initiatives or projects? Is it being shared with Mike, Diversity Committee, others? Um, so Mike is definitely aware of the study, has been really supportive. Um, I think that uh, he would probably certainly be, be interested in the implications um, in whatever sort of write-up we end up doing. Um, I don't I don't know. I'm not on. I'm not on the diversity committee. I don't know um, if anybody here is. Uh, certainly I'm on the diversity committee. Oh, Melody can speak to that then. Excellent. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, that is something that, like, I yes, I plan to bring up, um, but uh, have not yet. Yeah. Anybody else? We just did such a good job that no one needs any further explanation. I think it was awesome. I think we did a really fantastic job. I am wondering um, if you, so you said you had 60 some responses, is that right? Yes. That seems really high to me, that's great. Yeah, we had it open from, I wanna say, just before or just after Thanksgiving until Valentine's Day. So it was kind of, um, you know, none of the timelines have been super ideal, but yeah, we had, we had good luck. And, um, you know, we were lucky that a lot of the chance, uh, people who help organize chance are, are interested in the libraries and interested in what we're doing. And so we're definitely willing to share um, ideas and hang posters in their offices, all that cool stuff. So. All right, we're getting a lot of thanks and compliments on this wonderful presentation. Um, so if no one else has questions, we can definitely end this a bit early. Um, and I would recommend that if you have questions that come up later, please feel free to send those directly to Rachel and Melody, who of course can speak uh, more in depth about this. I'm going to go ahead in the chat and um, put our uh, evaluation form for the ULVLC sessions. So if you see that there, I'll just go ahead and throw it in just one more time. Why not? Um, and uh, ask y'all if you have a chance to just fill out that form, please, so that you can uh, give us feedback. We're using it to make decisions about the rest of this session or rest of these sessions, the rest of this virtual learning community, which will be continuing indefinitely as we all can probably imagine right now. Um, and again, I'll throw that uh, LibGuide link in here. And that is where you will be able to see this session and also the slides um, afterwards. So Rachel and Melody have kindly agreed to share their slides and I'll make sure that those go up. Um, I am going to stop the recording now.